Mr. Chairman, my dear professors and colleagues, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Edmund Kai for uh, giving me this very important topic to talk about. So I'm going to speak about pair donation. And pair donation is when uh, two incompatible uh, or when incompatible uh, pairs, uh, they exchange donors to receive compatible pairs. So they exchange or they swap. And, and this is a form of living donation, of course. So I'm going to speak about the indications, the types, the history, innovations, and the situation of KPD, uh, kidney pair donation in Egypt, and then I'm going to conclude. What the reasons for participating in KPD programs is uh, the presence of incompatibility, which could be due to ABO incompatibility, especially those with the O group, they have antibodies for the A and the B, and it's not very easy to find a compatible donor, the HLA incompatibility, or sensitization of the recipients against the donor due to previous blood transfusions, pregnancies, or previous transplantations, and of course, the calculated panary atom antibody and the level uh, correlates with the difficulty with which the recipient is going to find a donor because we're going to have a big list of unacceptable HLA antigens and, of course, a longer waiting time. And if you look here, this is a waiting list based on the uh, uh, opt-in data as of January uh, 2020, and you can see that the number of wait lists in the U.S. Uh, for all organs is more than 124,000 patients, and out of those, Almost 103,000 patients are uh, potential kidney recipients. Another group of patients who come to the TPD are those who are compatible patients, but they wish to improve the quality of their transplants. For instance, if you have a relatively young patient with an older donor, like a mother wants to donate to her son, and um, they hope to find a, a younger match, or non-sensitized patients who have HLA mismatches with the recipients, but they need to improve the quality by having uh, more. They have the goal of increasing the number of matches uh, that they share with the donor. And that's because antigen match matters. If you compare here uh, the half-life of the sixth antigen match, which is 41.4 years, as compared to lesser antigen matches, they all range between 22.6 to 26.5 years. And because the donor age matters, again, if you compare those who are 65 years and older, the 10-year survival is 29% as compared to younger age groups, which ranges between 56% and 62%. So this donor is going as incompatible with the recipient and is going to give to this recipient and, and vice versa. And, and this we call a two-pair exchange. You can also have a three-pair exchange when this donor gives this recipient, and then the donor will give the other recipient, and the third donor will give this recipient. And you can have four-pair exchange, five-pair exchange, and at the end of the day, it is a closed chain. It, come, it will come to an end. On the other hand, if you have an altruistic donor or an undirected donor, this is a donor who wants to donate uh, to him to somebody he doesn't know just to improve the quality of his life. So this donor is going to give this recipient and then the donor of this recipient will give the other recipient and it will go so on and so forth and it could never end, may never end. So this is called the uh, never ending altruistic donor chain. It can only end when one of the donors will uh, give uh, the kidney to a patient on the wait list. And this is usually one of the uh, uh, hard-to-match uh, recipients. So it's more like uh, a domino. A each uh, donor uh, gives uh, the fitting recipient, and so as such, one uh, uh, altruistic donor will uh, help many patients to get transplanted. And this is one of the topics, how six extraordinary acts of kindness saved 100 lives. So it first started on a small scale, um, this uh, matching of uh, uh, donor-recipient pairs was managed by the local hospitals and by uh, partnering with the uh, area hospitals. And it, uh, it was the idea of uh, Felix Rappaport, and then it first started in South Korea in 1981 and in Switzerland in 1999. United States started in 2000 and in the uh, Netherlands 2003 and in Canada it started in 2005 
And then uh, uh, the Dynalen network of uh, organ uh, sharing, they started uh, to do multicenteric uh, kidney pair programs throughout uh, uh, US. And then it spread uh, through the rest of the world uh, in many countries. And in the US, we have the federal government organized uh, uh, re registries, but there are also other registries like the uh, National Kidney Registry, which is one of the biggest registries uh, worldwide. And uh, you can see the numbers uh, of the paired organizations increasing over the years, starting from the year 2000 to 2012, and still increasing up till now. It is approaching or almost approached 1,000. And these red bars are uh, the National Kidney Registry, and they are really contributing with a bigger number of uh, kidney uh, donations, and paired kidney donations. And of course, the wider it gets, you will have more chances to have more optimized sharing, and you will have more chances to accommodate those who are hard to match uh, recipients. And of course, it requires a sophisticated algorithms and software platform. And this is just an example. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, programs, the Alliance of Pair Donations, where they first uh, match for the ABO and compatibility, and then uh, they uh, they go on for virtual cross match after excluding uh, the unacceptable HLA antigens, and they give points for the age difference and on the number of B locus HLA mismatches and the DR locus HLA mismatches, and they give points for the high serologic panreactive antibody of the recipient, and they give bonus points for those younger than 18 years, for those who were donors themselves, and for CMV negative to CMV negative, for Epstein Barr virus negative to ABV virus negative, for zero antigen match mismatches, and for those who are, uh, and they give bonus for those who are on the recipient's wait time. This is one of the interesting papers, which is innovations in kidney pair donations that was that occurred over the past years. And according to this paper, one of the most important innovations is the shipping of living donor kidneys across the U.S. Uh, before that, the the donors had to travel to the city. This this started in 2008, actually. So before that, the donors had to travel to the city of uh, their matched uh, KPD matched recipients, and they undergo surgery in unfamiliar circumstances away from family and friends. Now the kidneys are shipped on commercial airlines. They are not attended. They are not accompanied with a GPS just to know the whereabouts of the kidney, and that's it. So. Uh, by doing so, this encouraged donors to donate, and this really resulted in an increase in the donor pool. And uh, there are many articles stating that uh, the, the long uh, ischemia, cold ischemia time, is no, it's no big deal, really. This is the oldest and the coldest one of the articles, shipping living donors. It was in 2,363 patients. Uh, from February 2008 to May 2018, <coughs> Delayed graft function and distance of graft failure occurred in 5.2% and 4.7% of cases, but there was no significant association between delayed graft function and donor age if below or above 65 years, and sorry, and the cold ischemia time if more or less than 16 hours. Actually, the patients, the kidneys are put in, a, in an ice box, not even uh, attached to a pump for the, for the KPD programs. Now, another very important innovation is the voucher, and this really took KPD a step further by resolving the problem when the, when the donor and the recipients are incompatible by time. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> this is what we call advanced donation here. The donor, uh, for time constraints, can only donate at the present time, even if the spared recipient has not yet found a match suitable donor and is not scheduled for surgery. Uh, so, uh, this uh, study was done by Fleckner and colleagues, and 10 uh, such donors have facilitated 47 transplants. And by the time this was uh, published, 2015, eight other paired recipients have received a kidney between two weeks and 19 months. Now, this is another thing, again, for the sake of the time, it's the banking. 
And that's again when the donor <coughs> is not able to donate at the present time because his recipient is not yet in need for a kidney, but then he will not be able to donate in the future time because of aging, because of, un of expected mortality, of other events like work, travel, or pregnancies. So what they do is that they donate the paired kidney to the paired kidney program, and in exchange, there is a commitment made to have the recipients to have the priority to receive a living donor transplant whenever and if ever needed. So this is the voucher donor is going to act like a, an altruistic donor, and it will open a long chain, and it will help many uh, patients to get transplanted. And when the recipients of that donor they will need, if ever he needs a transplant, then he will be given the donor that concludes the chain. Another thing in the innovations, in the laboratory innovations, such as cryopreservation, which increased the convenience for donors, or as improving the speed of the parent exchange programs, and really the success of KPD, it does not only rest on the uh, surgical procedures or the immunosuppressive medications, but it has to do with the mathematical and logistical optimizations. With advancing in the programs, there is more complex mathematical algorithms, computer software, and one of the examples of the logistical optimization is that the image of the kidneys uh, from uh, the donor hospital can be viewed by the recipient's surgeons anywhere, anytime, with a click of the mouse. And why is everybody pushing uh, for the KPD uh, to evolve and increase? And that's, of course, you all know that living donor kidneys last longer than the diseased kidneys. And we all know also that preemptive transplantation has a greater tenure survival as compared to transplantations after 24 years of dialysis. And these are the, the outcome of the National Kidney Registry as compared to living donations in the US. And you can, and you can see here that with increasing years, uh, the outcomes becomes better, and this is probably due to superior avoidance of antibody. In spite of the fact that it has more difficult cases, like those with more cold ischemia time, hypersensitized uh, patients, uh, highly sensitized patients, and more e-transplants. Now, uh, what about KPD in Egypt? In Egypt, we are overpopulated, so we should have donors, but unfortunately, there is lack of awareness, lack of awareness to living donation, not to mention the altruistic donation. So this is something we have to work on. And of course, it's easier to transport organs. We don't have the vast area like in the US, we don't have to ship organs. We can just take it by car, and uh, it's up to 16 hours, uh, cold ischemia time is no problem. We can start from others, and, and I know we don't have to, in, to invent the software. I know of international organizations that are willing to help us for free and give us their softwares. We can start simple, say you're doing a couple of paired donations on two or three couples. We can start on a small scale, including two or three uh, centers. We can, we can learn from the experience of others by making things easier, by not having to donate in the same time. I know that it was insisted before that donors should donate at the same time for fear of one donor uh, refusing to donate after the first donor has done. But I think we have to have rigid rules for that. And one of the things that is going to help to encourage donors to donate is when they are reimbursed for surgical procedures and travel expenses and maybe one uh, month's salary. Uh, which calls for a national organization and what's more important is a high level of coordination between the hospitals and the national organizations to have at the end um, to have at the end allocation done according to the principles of equity utility and justice uh, besides the uh, being medically sound of course what are the options for patients with unmatched donors mm -hmm. So either that the patient will discard uh, transplantation, which means that he's going to live the rest of his life on dialysis, or he's going to look for a deceased donor, which means that he's going to have a long wait list. It's going to mount to years, six or seven years. And besides, we don't have that in Egypt yet, in spite of the presence of the law. Well, the third option is to have to do desensitization. And yes, we know that there is survival benefit with kidney transplants for HLE incompatible living donors. And this is one of those studies, the very many studies which show over eight years, uh, there is a, a significant survival benefit for those 
who, who for recipients uh, of incompatible uh, transplants as compared to recipients on the waitlist or had a disease transplant as compared uh, to the waitlist only recipients. But again, whatever protocol you're going to do, you will be using expensive medications. The standard of care, the thymo, the IVIG, the rituximab and plasma exchange, and you remember the many evolving drugs that Professor Henny mentioned yesterday, they, these are expensive things. So you will have a great cost and you will subject the patient to immunosuppressive medications. And at the end of the day, antibody mediated rejection is the risk of carrying 50% of those HLE incompatible grafts with a two times increased risk of graft loss if clinically silent and six times increased risk of graft loss if associated with graft dysfunction. And this is just to show you that uh, the desensitization rate for the National Kidney Registry are uh, dropping with increasing the numbers of the, of the KPD. Now, the last option is to have another donor, which could be a KPD or a commercial donor, which unfortunately exists in Egypt, of course. In the absence of a KPD program, we will have to handle the program. I don't know how it's going to be handled. So uh, this is one of the very interesting articles that I came across, published in the Journal of the Egyptian Study in Nephrology, 2018, Kidney Pair Donation Program, a National Solution Against Commercial Transplantation, by Professor Hassan Shahisha, Professor Muhammad Abdel Gawai, Muhammad Abdel Muhammad Abdel And they came to very interesting suggestions to establish a National Kidney Pair Donation Program in Egypt, Establishing a national organization for KPD program, defining transplant centers participating in the program, setting up rules for donor allocation and matching, standardization of laboratory and imaging testing for the donor on national basis, setting up donor follow-up clinics with full insurance in a consistent manner for donor safety and as a support for their donation, and acquiring sufficient financial support for the program. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, kidney pair donation is a remarkable innovation in and of itself. It has the following advantage and increases the number of kidneys available for transplantation, allowing the most incompatible pairs find a match and get transplanted, avoidance of the risks and costs of desensitization strategies designed to remove anti-donor antibodies, decreasing the waiting time on national transplant lists, and provision of living donor grafts, which are usually superior to cadaveric ones. And at the end, put an end to commercial transportation. And by including AVOHLA compatible pairs, this is going to increase the chance of finding a greater HLA match and a younger donors, which is correlated with more kidney life years and will increase the donor pool for difficult to match pairs. And I dare say that KPD is the best option for living donation and should be considered for all potential living donors. And it's badly needed in Egypt, especially with the absence of deceased transplantation, the non-familiarity with ABO incompatible transplantation, and the high cost of desensitization and existing commercial transplantation. And thank you very much.